Market News Content Strategy Webinar in our series. Today's discussion is going to be about content rigor, driving a cohesive strategy between paid and organic. And I have with me a guest that really understands how to evaluate a SaaS business and determine where the major wins can come from organic, driving SaaS revenues up, and focusing on the entire funnel. Um, topics, as you know, I love. Introducing uh, co-founder and CEO of 10Speed, Nate Turner. Thanks for joining us. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about 10Speed, what your mission is, how you got there? Um, perhaps, you know, a little bit about your Papa Shot records. You know, I do my <laughs> research. Uh, and as, as, a, as a fellow classic gamer, uh, and I might or may or may not hold a unbreakable world record, look it up uh, okay. on something. I, I want to hear about that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just go ahead and start with that. Um, <laughs> That's probably what's what's uh, interesting at the moment. Um, uh, yeah, I love uh, kind of gravitate to the Papa Shot anytime uh, kind of hit up an arcade. Um, so uh, pretty obsessively just keep playing over and over until I can can break whatever record currently stands there. So I've done it a few <laughs> times it. and it's kind of become a, a fun thing to, to seek out and see so it can be done. So uh, yeah, so it, it, anyway, um, yeah, like you said, Co-founder CEO of 10Speed. Uh, we've been at it for a couple of years, really focused on content optimization, helping you know SaaS and PLG companies, you know, build and scale that motion to drive organic revenue. So that's kind of been our mission: is really to help companies add additional, uh, at least a million uh, in additional organic revenue. Um, and so, you know, as part of that, it's it's SEO, it's content strategy, uh, content creation, but also understanding and kind of helping build some of the good foundations for the process and systems to identify content decay, uh, you know, have good process around publishing and consistency. Um, and then also just the, the further down the funnel CTAs, uh, really understanding business impact and be able to uh, help drive more of that. Uh, and like I said, sort of build that into uh, a revenue generating channel for companies. So. Uh, been doing that for a while, spent uh, eight and a half years at Sprout Social, uh, leading all acquisitions. So that kind of uh, dovetails a bit into sort of that balance of paid and organic. Um, I led that, managed about half a million budget per month uh, on the paid side, but also you know, were kind of building and scaling organic. Um, and then I was consulting for a number of companies, um, which led to just sort of seeing an opportunity to, to really still a lot of opportunity to help companies in this area, which which led us to, to start 10 speed. So how, how, how has been the journey? So you were in house and you know, that's my journey too. It was in house consult in house for, you know, 15, 16 years consulting on the side throughout so I could stay current on some, you know, industries which weren't associated with my in house. Um, and yep. then going into being a founder, uh, a co founder, in your case, it's in house to consultancy, you're going from, um, you know, your methodology, your success to processize, you know, but did you go from your own success to bespoke things as a consultant to then 10 speed where you're trying to build scalable process or SOPs or, you know, where are you in that journey? Yeah. I mean, consulting was, um, kind of a, you know, fractional head of marketing, head of growth. Right. And so it was really kind of, uh, a lot of what I had been doing at Sprout, um, then kind of helping companies. And so, ended up finding an opportunity to help companies um, with existing marketing teams that were kind of in between or, or preparing uh, for a marketing leader. And so kind of coming in an interim role, figure out what they needed, help hire that person on board, overlap and kind of work myself out of a job. Um, and so 10 speed ended up being a very niche down version of, of that and, and really drawing in um, where, where I saw a lot of opportunity uh, versus consulting consulting like i said was pretty broad but um yeah that that really helped there and then you know obviously with 10 speed we have a lot more process and and systems for ourselves and, and for clients than than i did for consulting i love that so what's the one that you would draw from you know from your experience that you are like so pumped about so, so the reason why i ask that is because you know your persona if someone looks up nate turner and looks up some of the other work that you've done and, and you know webinars and podcasts the stuff that i'm most excited about talking to you are process improvements, why teams need content strategy, not just, you know, churning the butter and putting content yeah, on their website. Yeah. Um, and so what, what do you feel like has gone where you were in house and you're like 
most pumped about bringing a process to a team, you know, regardless of what stage they're in. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I saw pretty consistently with in the consulting side and, and felt very um, contradictory to my experience at Sprout was there wasn't like a clear, there often wasn't a clear plan, longer term plan and a sort of roadmap of like the content being that's going to be created, whether that was blog content or any other format. Um, with like really logical ties to ICP and the intent and and like the product. Um, and then they're just often lacked a lot of um, consistency and rigor to be publishing consistently, having like, even just saying like, we you know we're gonna do uh, eight posts a month or whatever. And like consistently doing that, like, it, you know, it could be two in one month and then three in another and then 10 and just sort of like, all over the place, um, which was very different than, than our experience at Sprout, which was, you know, quarterly roadmap planning, monthly planning, monthly content decay evaluation, uh, very, you know, clear deadlines and, and lead times on uh, design requirements and, and uh, you know, reviews and editing and, and all that to just kind of let it be humming as a machine. And so um, I would say that's kind of like a lot of what we've seen or what I saw in the consulting side that was just, you know, missing, you know, or, or not as good as it could be. And then now with clients, um, is something we're able to kind of step in and, and say, Hey, we have a process to really make sure we're on track. We're planning out ahead. This is tied to your ICP, to your goals, uh, and really bring in who you want to bring in. And we can help kind of be that steady drumbeat and project manage and, and keep things going, uh, on a regular basis. Okay. So you've said the word decay twice. So I've got to dig into some decay, right? Yes. Um, this is a tough one, right? It's it's one where I've seen agencies call out decay as a phenomenon. It's just a standard phenomenon of human practice, right? When really <laughs> it's because the people's websites aren't set up right, or they're not they don't have a good information architecture. And so older content just naturally gets devalued. We call it, you know, the, the falling off the cliff or, or however you want to say it. And then you have the, you know, I'd say SEO, more correlation SEO, um, snake oil salesmen who are calling out decay as being something that has to do with Google, Google algorithms. But how do you see it? Do you see it as those two? And, and, I, and I'll, just, I'll just platform my stance is, you know, intense change content mm -hmm. content even if it's very prominently placed um may require more coverage over time it may require mm -hmm. you know so how do you balance those you know the assessing decay so that it doesn't um fall into that bucket of being like oh this is like a google thing and turns it into a no i really have to keep my content up to date and beautiful right and yeah. i think there's, there's so much misinformation how do you balance that yeah, there's um, it. It was something that, that I struggled to really put together for a while, and ended up sitting down and um, just putting it all into a blog post um, and uh, scribbled out a, a graphic on my iPad that kind of helped show what I wanted to show. And, and the funny thing is that that's sort of um, I didn't I, I didn't uh, watermark the graphic, and I've I've seen it um, a lot of places. It's <laughs> um, you know, potentially one of my least time spent on, but most, uh, widely distributed pieces of work. Um, but it, 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 you know, really was helpful just to get all the thoughts out on like, just going phase by phase of like, what are all the reasons that caught, like, what are all the things that cause decay or what are all the, the ways that it can happen? You know, and mm -hmm. that's like the search intent changes over time. Um, yeah. you know, external competition, like you had something, someone just you know, did a better job and, and created something better. There's internal competition where you're, um, you know, mm -hmm. creating too much content that overlaps a bit and make, you know, at, send some confusing signals. It can, can challenge that, um, you know, and a number of, of other things. And then you kind of go into the next step, which is like, how do you actually diagnose that? What are the tools you use? How do you understand what's important? What's not like, what is a big deal? And then there's, you know, the last piece, which is like all the different ways that you address it, which is, 
you know, a, a refresh, a full rewrite, you know, consolidation of multiple pieces. Uh, there's like a number of things that, that can kind of be done to, to resolve it. And so that's where I think it becomes this, you know, labyrinth of, of possibilities um, to try to, you know, look at an entire um, a catalog of, of URLs for, for a company and understand what's going on. And so that's, you know, where we've really built some, some great process around like a content decay audit. And uh, there are some tools out there that'll kind of like, you know, punch in your site or connect your analytics and it'll pull up some stuff and I think it's helpful, but it doesn't really get into all those layers that, that we've laid out. And so, um, and then the, the why behind it is just that, you know, the reality and we kind of built like a content decay tool calculator, basically, that's like, um, just kind of helps show that, like, if you're decaying at 10%, you know, uh, it, your traffic is decaying at 10% every month, that becomes a substantial amount of work you have to do on the top end, you know, on the on the new side to even offset that before you even get into growth. So you're just sort of eroding that compounding growth um, with that uh, being um, unaddressed. And then the last piece I would say is just that I think that for a while, sort of within the content marketing sphere, like the idea of updating content became very popular and, and a lot of folks sort of understood, okay, I need to update my content. Um, but again, it sort of was a lot of like surface level um, changes and some people would even just sort of change the published date within the CMS and not actually change anything and sort of try to like game the system. And, you know, as, as with anything with algorithms that over time, they, um, they really understand the, the behavior that's sort of gaming versus, um, genuine benefit. And so, um, <clears throat> I think that that went a little ways and then it just didn't, didn't get anywhere. And so then, um, you know, I think that's where you kind of get some of the ineffective solutions, some of the the blaming of the algorithms and, and things like that that you mentioned. No, I, I think that's spot on. I think that, you know, the difference between update for cause, right, and optimize yeah. and, you know, add a, you know, adding a section to a page for purpose, right? It gets into the, I love the two way, the way that you described it, because it's almost like a stacked why. It's why do this in the first place is yeah. a different answer to why this and not that. And I think yeah. that's where people get into a lot of trouble. It's they're, they're like, you know, and this was the cur the maturity curve of the past five years, six years of how many people did you talk to, you know, six years ago and they were like, oh, we don't even update content, right? Yeah. We never update content. And now, if you don't update content on the reg and don't have a plan and prioritization prioritization methodology for it, I mean, you are so, so behind. I mean, you are years behind at your org, no matter how big you are. Um, so yes. it gets into, over time, things that become um, ubiquitous, the why do it becomes less important. And I think you're servicing the need of, you know, hey, we all agree. We do this because we want compound interest. We don't want to be fighting for equilibrium, <laughs> which right. you described. Yeah. And uh, and so then it's saying like, why this, not that. And so like, what you know, how would you how would you address that and say, hey, why update this and not that? How do you do that? Yeah, I think that that's the even the next level um, of consideration. Mm -hmm. and, and that's so. First of all, if you, if you are interested in that blog post, I think just Google content decay. And mm -hmm. I think it's still number one there or, or close to, uh, it's all there, but I think what's, what's not covered. Just that hashtag, is... hashtag a rank brag there. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but it's, um, the, the thing that, that it, I didn't necessarily get into completely in the, the blog post and maybe is worth, uh, an update to, to, to go a bit further is the the consideration around like business relevance and business right. impact you know and so mm -hmm. pruning i think it, you know is a solution that that i uh, i talked about that obviously if you like we run into this all the time where there's this weird legacy post that every company seems to have that doesn't really make sense to their company but it generates a lot of traffic so nobody wants to like reset the baseline and so there's just like this 
this weird piece there. So always, <laughs> as you you know, stack or like sort the the data and kind of see where where everything stands, you start to go through. You go, okay, you know, I understand why this one dropped off, and I don't care. Um, and so I'm going to move on to the next one, or I'm going to you know uh, redirect that to something more relevant, or 404, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, so that's sort of one logical consideration. It's just like this, that doesn't matter that the traffic's gone down. Um, and then, you know, from there, I think it becomes, you know, what are some of the more important pieces to business impact? You know, so obviously if you have one that pretty consistently drives conversions and, and you know, it's an important page, like you probably should prioritize that, um, ahead of, of some of the others. So that's where I nice. think the, that piece comes in is just understanding his business impact would be the next level of consideration. Yeah. Before I get in, before we get into, I want to talk about some of the, um, you know, managing the portfolio of organic expense and paid, because I know you ran paid at, at Sprout Social uh, and, you know, my yeah. background, I, I ran paid at Knowledge Storm. I was yeah. doing Google AdWords before it was, uh, before it was self-serve and you had to send them spreadsheets um, <laughs> and you were paying CPMs, nice. you know, that, that yeah. ages me nice and nice and nice and well. We were buying Remnant at five dollars CPM on any word we can get. Isn't that hilarious? Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, the before we get into there, I think you just you describe a real nuance. Um, what I would caution teams against is a person that's not a Nate Turner. It's going to be hard for them to make a great decision about what you don't care about, right? I've sure. seen so yeah. many teams where it's just an old page but it has so much power and it's about important concepts. It takes a really, you know, alien, that alien weird piece that's sitting so far away for us to just forget about it or even remove it. Yeah. You know, if it has any way of being woven into the appropriate fabric for the learning journey or the buyer journey or post-purchase, we're going to figure out that path. And that's, that's something that yeah. you specialize in. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think there's, it's a fair point. And I think um, even with some of our clients, there's, it's less of like a total, we're not necessarily totally enabled or they, they don't have the ability to fully give us the green light, but we can collaborate and say, hey, here's the 12 that from our perspective don't really seem to fit ICP or like they're not really contributing to like the overall picture of what your company's an authority on, uh, you know, any of that kind of stuff. And we can lay those out and kind of help package it up and put together the story for them mm -hmm. to speak to leadership and just say, Hey, here, you know, look at this content. Do we actually think this is a good reflection of our brand and like, you know, kind of go through those pieces and then like, do, do we want to all agree at, you know, would you as a leader want to, you know, give me the green light to get rid of this and we can like, tell the story to executive team board, whatever, that yes, our organic traffic is dropping by X, you know, and this is the new baseline and this is why, and it's a healthy thing. And then we move forward. So you're right that some, some folks may not be able to just fully uh, have the autonomy to do all that, but I think it's still, still worth kind of putting it together and, and raising that to leadership as, yeah. as a healthy thing to do. I think publishers have a harder time than SaaS companies. I think SaaS companies, a lot of times, yeah. they'll get it. A publisher is, you know, you have editorial teams who are saying, you know, oh, that's a 2019, you know, price guide. Uh, it can't possibly have value. You're like, no, it really does. Um, and, you know, sometimes <laughs> in the SaaS side, you know, when you get those alien pages, um, you know, I had one for a translation software company where someone posted, a uh, blog about curse words and expletives in a foreign language and it blew up and got the millions of views and like yeah that's when the tires yeah. screech and you really got to be creative to weep to pull that back in yeah. to the real value of the business and i love that example because it's so like you can you can relate like something took off and what do you do if that takes off yep. um, and yep. so I, I love the way you described it because it, it it provides a a framework for that we're not maybe maybe, we maybe aren't always just deleting that stuff we're trying to figure out how to weave it back in and, and do some smart things and i guess that speaks to the the balance of campaigns and you know when you get a SaaS company who you know 
maybe they're in the early earlier stage of the company in general, not necessarily early stage of the content marketing team, um, but just the company in general, what are the typical, what's the typical engagement look like? What are you looking for um, to, to bring value for kind of an earlier stage team? By the way, yeah, I want I mean, that I million, think... I want that million dollars in additional a AR. So yeah, talk yeah, about that. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. you know, I think uh, as much as possible, we love to start close to product. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and whether that you would call it, you know, one piece of content over the other, a middle of funnel or, or bottom of funnel, like mm -hmm. in general, higher intent, closer to product, um, very logical, like this topic is clearly someone with the pain that your product solves. We can highlight your product. Um, so, you know, some people call that product led content or whatever you want to say, like, I think that's really a preferred way to start and it's not necessarily a big traffic driver um mm -hmm. but it is you know closer to, to setting that foundation of of um capturing the intent and also um driving the business impact and this is where we can start to maybe bridge a little bit into like the paid versus organic stuff mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and then over time then you can start to build out topic clusters and 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 awareness building concept concepts that will ultimately kind of funnel through into to more of what you've built there but earlier stage um yeah i think that's that's certainly a big a big thing and we also you know encounter a lot of folks who are um early stage companies tend to need to be doing more thought leadership and kind of putting their um their stake in the ground on like why they're different or, or why what problem they're solving and so um we typically can have some pretty good collaboration in terms of strategy to help understand like what are the the thought leadership topics that they're working on internally and how do we you know make sure we kind of understand and, and can build potentially ways for those to to dovetail nicely and, and be able to interlink and, and stuff like that too so um but yeah i would say that's typically where we like to start is is higher intent um as much as possible and then build from there higher purchase intent or is it higher evaluation intent? How do you classify or think of that? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think um, both. I mean, I think that's where like the very high purchase intent um, is typically going to be more of the SERPs with with more paid search, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and some of that on on the paid side. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, certainly as as much as possible. Uh, you know, we had a very successful, super early stage. I think it was seed stage company. Um, and we created just a big pricing guide basically um, that broke down their costs versus like some of the alternatives because they were positioning against uh, some like more typical ways that things are done. Um, and so it was just kind of this big pricing guide and that ended up being, you know, very, very high purchase intent, high, high intent um, piece that, that did quite well. So nice. Yeah. And that, yeah, I mean, that one did well on traffic and, and conversions and sometimes you get lucky and, and find those early on, but um, yeah. Nice. I have a great webinar replay uh, with Josh Spilker, um, who mm -hmm. is a master of middle of the funnel overload, which is what I call his strategy, the MoFu yep. overload. It's, you know, and, and the why gets in. So go check that one out, folks. It's if you care about what, what Nate Turner is talking about right now, you got to get in there. Um, it, the why on that is, is core and, and how do you see the view of, how do you view the why being because it's something you can put points on the board quickly and sell it internally versus this is actually the best thing to start with how do you differentiate those things um yeah that's a really good question um yeah josh josh Bilker's is awesome um we range was one of our clients um mm -hmm. when he came on board and we had the opportunity to to work with him for for several months which was really awesome to have such a yeah you know, like a powerhouse uh point of contact and you know really able to sparring partners and and collaborate <laughs> and divide work and everything and it, it was awesome so um yeah i think the it, you do pose a really good question i think um i, I think that that's it, yeah yeah i think for me like it's not as much about the agency us trying to get a win as an agency mm -hmm. uh, because even if you know 
like we do create proposals for people and kind of we don't they like build a full strategy in the proposal but we still kind of give some of the ideas and I, and I think even if someone didn't work with us i'd say you know start there like if you're gonna do mm-hmm. if you're only gonna do five or six pieces over the next few months because of bandwidth and you're not hiring an agency or you can't but get budget or whatever like please start there and i think it's because that is a natural thing as an early stage company that you have so much of like here's what our product does here's the pain it solves here's the benefits etc and that's really what you're trying to get through and so i think there's probably just some some additional benefits to an organization of really like thinking through having that um it supports some of the self-guided stuff especially within plg it supports mm-hmm. sales enablement if there's more of a sales led mm-hmm. or sales assisted motion um and so i think there's just a lot of things that make it a really strong foundation uh, versus being more tempted to go after the traffic of, you know, why, or like defining topics or, you know, why, you know, comparing or whatever it might be. So uh, just a lot of those like very top of funnel queries that are high search volume, but the the intent is going to be more mixed. You may not have much of your ICP within there, um, that kind of stuff. So I think did that answer your question? And I couldn't have been a better answer. I got you. And no, but it also legitimizes your business and what you're doing. So many agencies are will come in and they'll say, well, we're shooting for the bottom of the funnel, so we'll get the man gen budget. I mean, yeah. and it's straight up where it is. So how do you see pay-per-click as being currently in, in a lot of these businesses, that's gonna the budget's going to live with either a dedicated paid media team or with demand gen, right? right. And you know yep. the thing that demand gen hates unless they've found religion is early stage awareness and um, unbranded mofu under unbranded middle of the funnel. So right. how do you balance with somebody who has a demand gen budget um, or, you know, has a paid media org or even one person show and to make them want to support you and make them see the value of early stage awareness or middle of the funnel unbranded. So there, um, there's intersecting lines uh, in paid and organic um, investments. And so I, I've said before, I've talked to plenty of, of very early stage companies and just basically said, like, I don't think you should work with us right now. Like, put this money to pay. And I think the, the earliest gauge of that is like, if you're truly able to put in a dollar and get back more than a dollar on paid at the very beginning, then you need to start with maximizing that um, because that's just there. You know, you're just turning on the faucet, tapping into that demand. But at some point, as you try to get more and more of that, you start to get, you know, um, more mixed results. You have some campaigns that are, you know, maybe put in a dollar and you get 90 cents and, and it starts to have the efficiency that maybe the blended rate overall is still good, but within there you start to have some, some less efficient. And I think that um, that's where, you know, some of the more demand gen oriented folks that we've worked with, they're starting to see that. Like they, they see the writing on the wall and they know um, this can't be the only thing we do. And so they are starting to look at how do we start to build towards something knowing that it's not going to be, you know, as quick to turn on and ramp up as, as paid spend. But we know that this is still a channel that can, can kind of help blended acquisition rates and, and build over time. And so that's where I think, you know, you do reach that point, then eventually those lines sort of intersect where we, you know, encounter a lot of companies and tend to work with many of them at this phase where they're, they're spending, you know, at least six figures or more on, paid budget and they decide, you know what, we're going to do an analysis. We're going to find $20,000. That's the lowest performing in our paid spend. And we're going to cut those campaigns and we're going to invest it in here into, you know, organic, into just additional content marketing and, and really start to build towards that. So Obviously, you know, if you're starting out and you've got a budget of 5k a month for paid, 
you're not going to have, you, if anything, you're like missing out on opportunity and you're needing to, to ramp up your budget and, and capture that intent. But like, you're not going to have, you know, a big budget to, you know, cut some inefficient spend and, and spend elsewhere. Like that's just not the reality, but as the company does scale, that does start to be more of an opportunity as those lines, uh, potentially intersect. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's really the biggest thing is like if like I said, if you if you can get more than a dollar back from the dollar of spend, then please do that until you until you can't. And the only thing consideration is do you start to have a little bit of budget carved out to to start to set the foundation, to start the uh, getting things in motion on the content side, knowing it's not gonna last forever. Um, and then, you know, as you start to have some of that the inefficient campaigns and stuff like that, then you really have opportunities to, to reallocate and, and start scaling on the other side. Do you find though that those businesses have challenges? This is a, such a leading question. Do you find that those businesses have challenges with, that's such a leading question, with um, assignment of true value? Um, so a paid campaign that returns a buck 10 on a, on a buck might sound nice, but impact on bottom line impact on CAC LTV ratio, you know, may not be as awesome as making a dime there. Right. Or what, what is your, what's your take on that? And do you ever find teams that, um, are giving different values to paid conversions than they are to organic willy nilly or without, you know, the real story and, and how do you advise on that? Yeah. I mean, I would say the, the opening statement I would have there is that um, by and large companies are less sophisticated than I think most people mm -hmm. uh, would imagine totally agree. in this mm -hmm. area. Um, I think that there's often some level of understanding. Maybe it's just broken down as like at a revenue level of like paid versus organic or paid versus non-paid, excuse me. Um, but there yeah i think there's often a lot of of mystery and just companies don't have that really figured out and i'm not talking about like you have this perfect you know w shape attribution model and <laughs> events are getting all this i'm not even talking about that i'm just saying like just generally understanding what actually drives revenue and the the next layer of that is like what drives the efficient revenue and so like you said cac to ltv or like what's the payback period on this investment, you know, starts to be a bigger deal. Like what's the actual churn or this is channel churn, you know, 80% within three months or is it 18 months? Um, all of those things, you know, become easier as you get to a bigger company and get more of it established. Um, but um, a lot of early and, and growth stage companies, I think are, doing the best they can. And so I think that to answer your question, they, I think can sometimes fall into that trap of sort of misattributing uh, or, or um, having wrong expectations of what um, investments into non paid channels, what success looks like, um, mm -hmm. because it's hard to kind of understand the, the building compounding fact of the brand right. awareness that comes with that, the, the additional discovery, the fact that, you know, as long as you are to tie it back, uh, staying on top of decay, that it does continue to, um, you know, perform month after month. Um, and so I think there's, there's some there, but, it, but it is, I haven't really run into like people it, it intentionally saying, you know, non-paid stuff is worth less to us. Um, but it's just a bit more of that, Lucky like you. <laughs> Short, short term ROI, uh, I think is the is the harder piece. Um, You're finding good ICP then because it's I feel I hear I hear it so often the demand gen team devaluing, um, you know, traffic of particular types, um, and and so no that's that's awesome. I think one one innovation one thing that I like to bring up is that um, organic traffic that has a yield, a, a measurable yield, can actually increase the valuation of the company at a faster rate than paid. Right. Um, and that's, that's a, that can, that can also, uh, people, wait, what? So their, their perception is that of that immediate 
uh, gratification with yeah. paid. Um, but it's immediate gratification, but it can only, it's a linear impact versus a uh, exponential impact, right? Yes. On, on it, valuation. Yes. Yeah. 100%. And that's, so, I mean, I can say I started um, at Sprout Social, we had about 100K in ARR. Um, I came in, had about a 40K a month budget for paid search. And the overwhelming majority of our, well, first of all, we didn't even know where revenue was coming from. Uh, but the the overwhelming number of free trial signups anyway were um, from paid search. And then as we got more of that data, we validated, yes, that's there. And then when I left, organic, um, I mean, kind of the, the combination of organic search and direct was like, um, you know, 70% of new MRR. And the thing that that a lot of people haven't had the opportunity to experience, and I feel very uh, fortunate that I have, is like, yes, the the non-paid and the content marketing and the brand, it really starts to have the exponential side of it, whereas the paid side becomes really tough because, I mean, there's proven studies on, like, how much CPCs go up every year, like, mm -hmm. 10%, 18% of kind of like varies by industry and stuff like that. So you naturally have like your budget is becoming there. Your dollar for dollar, your spend is becoming less effective every year as CPCs are going up. And then you add to the fact that, you know, when you're building your plans for next year, the, um, your goals get bigger. And so you're going, wait a minute, I maybe get a marginal increase in budget. It might be flat. A lot of times you're told to do more with the same. And the CPCs are already like eroding, you know, 10 to 15% of my progress, but I have to right. grow 20%. So actually my growth is substantially more. And then that's where you really start to look at like, well, actually like, what if I just cut some of that out of this low, less efficient group of campaigns right. and fuel that into this area that's growing more exponentially. So it actually just really starts to shift. Like I said, the intersecting lines, the further you go along, like that can become a, a bigger and bigger Delta between them. Nice. No, I, I think right on the nose. Um, I'll give one additional worth. It's this makes your pr price ticket uh, for this webinar worth its investment. Um, and, and thank you, Carl, for the uh, updates. Um, and this will be for you specifically is and also you can ex you can um, expense content over time. Content doesn't have to be a one-time expense. It can be um, recognized as a uh, as a amortized or, or dep deprecatable expense. So if you're costing your content one time when you write it, you're broken. Go fix it, uh, and because that can actually even more amplify what you just said. Um, so check on check on how your business is accounting for the cost of content, and if they're accounting for that content at, all at once, you have a great optimization that you're going to pitch internally, um, and that can actually blow away a PPC campaign where costs are being declared up front. So something to think about. Yeah, okay. well, as I actually have not heard that before. Um, yeah. That I can understand that. Um, what like do you know what a typical period is it like over 12 yeah, months you can, you can declare it for yourself um, because it has an impact on your business over time as well um, yeah and so that that investment doesn't have to be a one-time thing um, so your cost the true cost of content is so much higher than what it usually is declared it's usually like the cost of the agency maybe the cost of the writer the true cost is how frequently are you updating it um, and various other aspects so there's if, as long as you're real about the total baked in costs, all your employees, your editors, your content marketing right. team. Um, yeah. So as long as you're baking a lot of those things in and assessing them appropriately, um, you don't have to eat all that cost up front. Um, and that's something that, you know, your team may decide that you can't do it that way, but there are teams that definitely um, do that yeah. as part of, and not just SaaS, but also publishers. So, or agencies, uh, uh, the way that they do it. So something to think about. Um, we talked about the negative of um, the negatives uh, or where you're finding the bottom 20, uh, but great question from uh, 
one of my favorite uh, people uh, from Sumo Logic. Uh, how do you see paid amplifying organic? How can paid support organic? Um, about how are you doing paid retargeting on organic audiences? Uh, that great three-part question uh, mm -hmm. that I love. Uh, I'd love your take on that. Yeah, it, yeah, that's great. Um, I'll start with the last one. Um, I think there's a, a ton of opportunity. Um, it's uh, one of the things um, I wrote about recently was there's just a lot of un, uh, untapped potential. If your company is getting 20,000 organic visits a month, I mean, that's a lot of traffic and like warrants really spending time figuring out how you could do more of that. One of those being retargeting. And I think the, you know, the mistake there is just throwing that all into a generic retargeting campaign. Cause obviously you, your homepage pricing feature pages, solutions, whatever it might be, your core site pages and, and product pages, um, is a much smaller quantity. If you add in, you know, a couple hundred blog URLs and, um, and like case studies and all like kind of just put it on the whole site that like dilutes it significantly, but um, there's some really great ways when you have more content to basically, you know, think through like a topic cluster or just like even categories or, or themes or however you want to do it, like go through and just find, Hey, here's four or five posts that are all some like tied to someone trying to do this or someone with this pain point or someone with this use case. Mm -hmm. And let's take all five of those, put those into a retargeting campaign that has a much more specific CTA and, and kind of goes from there. So totally uh, you know, love that. I think it's just a matter of spending the time to do it right uh, because otherwise you kind of dilute in your budget in putting it just across everything in a, in a generic campaign. Um, and then the other side uh, in terms of like paid strengthening organic and, um, and whatnot, I mean, we, like did some, some analysis and I've done this a little bit with clients and stuff like there's, you know, we pretty well validated by like turning off brand terms and in paid search and different things like that. Like there's, there, there's a, definitely a halo that kind of works bi-directionally mm -hmm. um, between the two. And so um, certainly uh, paid can help in that area where there's um, you know, people kind of coming back through branded organic search after they'd found an ad, um, vice versa. But I think the, the biggest thing is really understanding, uh, search intent, I think is probably the most fundamental thing when, when we're talking about paid search kind of, um, alienating like paid social LinkedIn ads, stuff like that at the moment. But, uh, specifically within paid search, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of analysis that needs to be done to really understand um, what is the, the true intent. You know, like you said before, is it purchase intent or is it research intent? And um, just kind of determining what is the best path, what is the best thing to put in front of them? Is it a, a carved out landing page that's just very stripped down, like social proof, let's get them to convert? Or do we want to actually like bring them to a blog post and, um, one of the examples um, that we had was uh, we had Twitter analytics blog content. We had Twitter analytics feature pages. We had Twitter, Twitter analytics focused ads. Um, and, you know, that alone was just one piece of you know, multiple networks and multiple you know, platform functionality. And it really took a lot of analysis to kind of break it down and understand like, what should the feature page, the Twitter analytics feature page be optimized for? What should the blog content be optimized for? Which, which paid terms are going to perform the best. Um, and so that kind of balancing of the intent and the best content to, to show them, um, across both channels, I think, or it's kind of one channel, but paid and organic, um, became pro probably the biggest factor there in how they, they work together, um, to to really just kind of like make sure there's no cracks uh, or missed opportunity and you're really getting the right people into the right place i love it i love that and just the nuance and just checking for understanding through the way you described that is um 
we want to make sure that we, when we do our paid, we use that channel to determine, is this the right uh, page for this query or this set of queries? Um, that's part of our, we're intentionally trying to get to that as the outcome. Is that what you're, what you were focused on there? Yes. Yeah. So okay. it's, um, yeah, you can just start to break it down and sometimes it's, it's testing it too, you know, like there's, there's opportunities to, yes, you know, really, um, shift away. But then, I mean, there's also just context clues too, where you understand like, wow, this SERP, we're the only one there, uh, on the paid side. And maybe we're just paying for something we could get organically um, versus, you know, trying to rank a piece of uh, content on your blog on a, a SERP that's just full of ads and clearly much more, um, you know, intent driven and, and, and maybe a higher purchase focus. So, um, yeah, there's a lot there. I mean, we did that with pricing page. Like, how do we what do we rank the pricing page for and, and what do you optimize for versus what are we going to like have in? the campaigns and um, site links within our paid search ads and all that that are focused on pricing. Like there's a lot to just kind of like break down. So I would just start with whatever's the highest value, um, you know, revenue generating and just sort of start there and, and kind of work through and figure out the balance um, to, to capture as much as you can on both paid and organic. I think that's a money maker. What you just described is extremely important. It's why a paid team needs to get along with the content team too. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I think a lot of teams, they make the same mistakes with organic as they do with paid in this respect. So they don't know the difference between, um, intent fracture, which is actually where, um, there's a lot of different ways someone could be thinking about this concept from the yeah. standpoint of their intent with the same query versus ambiguity or ambiguous meaning, because there's actually two meanings of the term. Um, versus yeah. the concept of we want all the real estate we can get, right? And so yeah. what the way that manifests is, you know, fighting over fake cannibalization that isn't actually cannibalization. It's maybe buying an ad with the exact same landing page as the thing that's ranking in search when you could do what you're describing and put a different intent. If you care about both and you're ranking with page one and you have the opportunity to position page two with paid huge opportunity yeah. you see this a lot in branded where um they're only trying to get real estate and their paid campaign goes to their home page and the result number one's going to the home page <laughs> it's like yeah. yeah you got the real estate but you could have gotten more right yeah yeah yep That's totally cool. agree i think it's um like i've become a pretty big advocate of within like a marketing org the structure like acquisition having kind of both paid and non-paid mm -hmm. um i think is is similar value to having a cro who is managing you know marketing and sales it's like the cro is like i don't really care if we have 10 mqls or 10,000 like this is the revenue we want and let's all work together towards the revenue and similarly it's like instead of having demand gen growth and then like all this other, you know, content teams that don't have as, as, uh, uh the same type of goals, like we just kind of all rolled up inside of acquisition. Then I think you, you benefit from being able to say like, Hey, look, I know this is your paid goals, but let's mm -hmm. do the right thing. Let's adjust this. Let's adjust your goals and, you know, let's shift this over where we can, can capture more and, and get the most out of it. And so, I, I totally agree. I think the collaboration there um, between the, the paid and, and non-paid side is is critical. Yeah, I, I, um, I have a great anecdote there. And by the way, on the notes, the way you describe that, I feel is, you know, teams need to get there. If they're not thinking critically about that, they need to drop the silos, use a use yep. a ten speed to break down that silo, and and get there. The the anecdote I'll ha I have is a SaaS company who. Um, demand gen and content were never getting along. Um, you know, content was early stage awareness. Demand gen was bottom of the funnel. Uh, and they had a team come in and, and, and kind of walk them into the middle of the funnel and, and start to get along. But one of the examples was in paid, 
um, being able to take something where they have early stage awareness content ranking um, and position their middle of funnel paid or position their later stage so they had both of those messages appearing and they could see yeah. the impact of that. So from the question that was asked and a great one, that's a great amplifier um, is to, to use your wins to potentially, you know, get more of your more of your message out there. Um, and that's that's something that is a big winner. And I, I love that example and I love the question. So, yeah. And I yeah, just to quickly build on what you just said, the, um, mm -hmm. the content is such a massive umbrella, mm -hmm. you know, and like you said, um, sort of like brand awareness side of things. And so um, I think that the most important thing is just understanding um, like objectives and not trying to, to force any one team to be trying to, to do too many things. And so um, we were fortunate at Sprout to have this, and I have helped other companies kind of work towards this, which is, you know, there's content that's created with the intention of it helping to drive growth and, and pipeline and revenue. And there is content that is generated to, or, you know, created to, build the brand and build awareness and there's content that's created to get PR and in, you know, some of those types of things. And, and it, like it works so much better when you let each have their own focus, like mm -hmm. stop trying to take something that's meant to be a think piece, thought leadership, maybe get picked up, in, you know, from a, a news outlet and trying to like, you know, force keywords into the title. <laughs> let it have an edgy title, you know, but also like let, you know, don't ha hold up a performance focused team with, you know, huge rounds of, well, let's go actually not publish this. And let's go brainstorm other ways we could do it. Like, no, just give them a lane and like, let them go as long as it's all inside of the brand, the voice, like there's, you know, a unifying direction and, and consistency. I think that it works really well because then you just start all of a sudden you're getting, you know, picked up in the New York times. You're getting like great backlinks that overall help the domain and help the brand. And I mean, I could not be a bigger advocate of, of brand and how much that helps every channel on the acquisition side, um, over time. So, yeah, I think that's awesome. And I think it's, it's, you, you can stay in your lane and you can build a great package of content that has components of brand that has components of, and that's where I, you know, I, if, if anyone listens to these webinars and you know, um, my feelings on cannibalization, where about 99.2% of things called cannibalization actually aren't, um, scientifically, <laughs> scientifically researched, uh, and, and only that small 0.8 are, um, but for a particular topic, you need brand assets, you need top of the funnel, you need middle of the funnel, you need bottom of the funnel, you need post-purchase troubleshooting. You need customer development um, yeah. and all of that. And, you know, that's one word. And the teams that are like, nah, one word, one page, you end up with a page that has a conversion hook, 3,000 words, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, you know and, and it looks like, uh, you know, it was made by uh, a large publisher who can get away with anything um, because that's, yes. they can get away with anything. Uh, what you aren't that person, and so you can't get away with anything with anything you want, and that's that's always been a burden. So I love the way you, you covered that. Um, speaking of post purchase troubleshooting, so I actually had a text from Clark, uh, who is a middle of funnel content advocate, and he cool. said, "Jeff, you usually add on. Thank you for listening to me, Clark. You usually add on when someone's talking about middle of the funnel that they should be doing competitive targeting." with content. So focusing on competitors post purchase gaps. I know it's an advanced technique, but so I'm looking at a competitor and I'm writing content as if somebody already owned that software and the problems that they would come into. Is that something that you think about ever? Um, yeah, I think to some extent, um, it's just typically just a matter of, of where that fits on the the scale of you know priority and an opportunity for someone um mm -hmm. certainly you know a lot that we'll do within um 
alternative, like kind of helping break down the alternatives from a competitor tool or mm -hmm. like a head to head comparison. Um, you know, obviously a lot more research going into that. Um, and those I think are really a company by company basis of how much they're comfortable with and, and how much they feel like their product has the edge that it needs to, to stand out right. and, and do that comparison. Um, uh, so I think there's, there's some of that. Um, but I, yeah, I think the, the post-purchase is certainly interesting. I think it also kind of just depends on the, um, you know, typical contracts and, and, uh, switching costs and some, some of that stuff, obviously, you know, $20 a month tool is a lot easier to get out of than a, you know, you know uh, what are $300,000 enterprise 24 month contract or, you know, something like that. So, um, yeah. yeah, but, but all things considered, I do think, um, that can be a really solid strategy because if you know, oh yeah, they went with a competitor, that that's a bummer. And there, here's the problems we know they're going to have. Cause I think a lot mm -hmm. of companies do know that like, oh, that was a mistake. You know, they're going to, they're going to regret it when they find out X. Um, and so, yeah, having some content there to, to address that, I think is smart. It just, you know, a great question, Clark. Thank you. And what it made me think about was something you said before about content decay just dovetailing it back is to say, did you rely too heavily on correlation SEO? Did you write, uh, you know, some sure, content yeah. that decayed more aggressively than you thought it would? Well, you got to call 10 speed <laughs> in that case. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but no, and, and that's, you know, that that's our message too. It's to say, you know, you, if you were, if, if all, if, if you were getting advice to copy your competitors, uh, your decay is going to be more accelerated. It's just true. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, that's where you see a lot of mistakes happening, um, with outsourced content teams, content farms, uh, where they're just looking at the top ranking page and they're giving their clients advice to basically copy it, um, yeah. and do, you know, more, more correlation SEO tax techniques, um, versus thinking critically and following the advice like which, like that, which you described today. So, uh, yeah. I think those are cool examples. This is a great example. Um, it's about prioritization, like you mentioned. Um, so yeah. awesome, awesome questions. Thank you so much, everybody who has listened uh, to us today. I love that mm -hmm. you know you thought about carving out budget from less optimized campaigns to take it. Um, hopefully, we've added even more to your thought process and saying, hey, we need to invest in this because it's got that compound effort and it can be um, attributed just as well um, as any yeah. other type of campaign. Um, if you want to have someone look at your entire site and give you insights as to what content should be created or updated most effectively and move the needle as quickly as possible, please book a personalized content audit with me or one of my colleagues uh, at this link right here, marketmuse.com, book dash demo. And how can people find you on social media and what should they be doing to connect with Tenspeed? Yeah, you can uh, find 10speed at uh, 10speed.io. That'd be the, mm -hmm. the easiest place to find us. Uh, also, um, we're pretty active on LinkedIn with the company page. Um, my, I think my LinkedIn username is Nate Turner one, the number one. Um, so yeah, I'd love to, to connect with you there um, and uh, be able to, to jump into additional conversations from there. Awesome, 10speed.io slash blog slash content decay. If I'm not mistaken, should, content, uh, dash, yeah. content dash, content decay. dash, go decay. read, go yeah. read that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. it's a, uh, it's a blazer. Go write that, go read that. Um, and Nate, thank you for joining us. This was such a great discussion. I mean, Thanks, there's, sir. there's a, uh, easy top 10 list that we can repurpose to market this recording, um, yes. and, and, and make sure we cover all the stages of the buyer journey for these SaaS companies who are worried about what content they should create, update. Um, and why their traffic's going down. Um, yep. So thanks again, and uh, I really appreciate all the time. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give it, give you a last word. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for for having me on, and and um, yeah, happy to to connect with anyone. Um, the some of the stuff we talked about today, I think, is pretty nuanced um, from from company to company, and there's a lot of a lot of things to balance across uh, paid and and non paid, and opportunities and how to make it work better together. So. Uh, yeah, appreciate you having me on to, to chat about it. Thank you.